This is the story of the prophetess Mother Shipton. While there are many different views, explanations, rumours and scepticism, we feel it is well worth presenting the historical and well-known legend on the life and prophecies of Mother Shipton. Whether all or any parts of the story are fact or fictionalised, we still feel that the fascinating and historical writings are well worth telling. The story begins with the birth of Ursula Sontil, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, the daughter of Agatha, a local girl who was only 15 and unmarried. Agatha refused to divulge the identity of the father and with no parents to support her, she was shunned and banished from the village. She found shelter in a cave on the outskirts of Nesborough by the bank of the river Nid, below Nesborough Castle in England. And it was there, one stormy night, in the year of 1488, with thunder, lightning and gales blowing, that she gave birth to Ursula. Shortly after her birth, the Abbot of Beverley took an interest in Ursula and placed her with a local family. Her mother was sent to a convent in Nottinghamshire where she died a few years later, never seeing her only child, Ursula, ever again. It was said that Ursula was a very unattractive child with a large crooked nose, a hunched back and her legs were twisted and she had to walk with a stick. But Ursula was bright and surprised her teachers with her intelligence. However, she left school at a young age due to the relentless taunting and teasing from the other children. Ursula eventually found her way back to the cave where she was born, preferring the solitude of the woods. At the age of 24, she met and married a young carpenter from York, Tobias Shipton. Some say she had bewitched him as she was too hideous for him to be attracted to her. Although there are varying versions, some say she and Tobias remained happily married until she passed away, but other accounts state that their life together was short as he died two years later and they had no children. The name Mother Shipton came years later when Ursula became the oldest woman in the village. She made a living telling the future and the fortunes of those who asked her. She also made a living by providing natural remedies and potions from herbs and flowers she gathered in the woods. She soon became known as the Nairsborough Prophetess. Her prophecies became famous. The king sent messengers from London to hear her prophecies, but she also became a target of Cardinal Wolsey. Wolsey became the subject of one of Mother Shipton's predictions. She told him that though he would see York, he would never set foot in it. While Wolsey retorted that when he did indeed make it to York, he would then build a huge pyre on which to burn her as a witch. As it transpired, Wolsey made it to Corwood on the outskirts of York, where he was arrested for treason by Henry Percy, the sixth Earl of Northumberland. As he made his journey back to a trial in London, Wolsey fell ill and died at Leicester on the 29th of November in the year of 1530. So, it seemed that Mother Shipton was correct. 
Cardinal Wolsey did not make it to York, although he did see it. Among her many predictions, she is believed to have foretold of the Black Death, the Great Fire of London, the defeat of the Spanish Armada, the execution of Charles I, and the end of the world. She is even thought to have predicted the invention of the internet, where she says, around the world men's thoughts will fly in the blinking of an eye. Mother Shipton even foretold of her own death, and on that very hour, she did indeed pass away. It was the year of 1561. Mother Shipton's cave still exists today and is a well-known and famous tourist site. And now, a word in uncouth rhyme of what shall be in future time. Upside down the world shall be and gold found at the root of trees. All England's sons shall plow the land, shall oft be seen with book in hand. The poor shall now great wisdom know, great houses stand in far-flung vale, all covered over with snow and hail. For those in wondrous far-off days, the women shall adopt a craze to dress like men and trousers wear and then to cut off their locks of hair. They'll ride astride with brazen brow as witches do on broomsticks now. A carriage without horse will go, disaster filled the world with woe. In London, Primrose Hill shall be, in centre hold a bishop's see. Through towering hills proud men shall ride, no horse or ass move by his side. Beneath the water men shall walk, shall ride, shall sleep, shall even talk, and in the air men shall be seen, in white and black and even green. A great man then shall come and go, for prophecy declares it so. In water, iron then shall float, as easy as a wooden boat. Gold shall be seen in stream and stone, in land that is yet unknown. A house of glass shall come to pass in England. But alas, alas, a war will follow with the work where dwells the pagan and the Turk. These states shall lock in fiercest strife and seek to take each other's life. When north shall thus divide the south and eagle build in lion's mouth. Then tax and blood and cruel war shall come to every humble door. Roaring monsters with men atop shall seem to eat the verdant crop and men shall fly as birds do now and give away the horse and plough. There'll be a sign for all to see be sure that it will certain be then love shall die, and marriage cease, and nations wane as babes decrease. When pictures seem alive with movements free, when boats like fishes swim beneath the sea, when men like birds shall scour the sky, then half the world deep drenched in blood shall die. For those who live the century through in fear and trembling this shall do. Flee to the mountains and the dens, to bog and forest and wild fens. For storms will rage and oceans roar when Gabriel stands on sea and shore 
and as he blows his wondrous horn, old worlds will die and you be born. A fiery dragon will cross the sky six times before this earth shall die. Mankind will tremble and frightened be for the six perils in this prophecy. For seven days and seven nights, man will watch this frightening sight. The tides will rise beyond their ken to bite away the shores and then. The mountains will begin to roar and earthquakes split the plain to shore. And flooding waters rushing in will flood the lands with such a din that mankind cowers in muddy fen and snarls about his fellow men. He bears his teeth and fights and kills and secretes food in secret hills and ugly in his fear he lies to kill marauders, thieves and spies. And when the dragon's tail is gone, man forgets, smiles and carries on to apply himself too late, too late for mankind has deserved his fate. His masked smile, his false grandeur will serve the gods, their anger stir, and they will send the dragon back to light the sky. His tail will crack upon the earth and rend the earth and man shall flee, king, lord and serf. But slowly they are routed out to seek diminishing water spout and men will die of thirst before the oceans rise to mount the shore and lands will crack and rend anew you think it's strange, it will come true. And in some far off distant land, some men, such as a tiny band, will have to leave their solid mount and span the earth, so few to count. Those who survive must begin again to build another human race, but not on land. Already there, but on ocean beds, start, dry, and bare. Not every soul on earth will die as the dragon's tail goes sweeping by. The dragon's tail would signify a comet. Not every land on earth will sink, but these will wallow in stench and stink of rotting bodies of beast and man of vegetation crisped on land. But the land that rises from the sea will be dry and clean and soft and free of mankind's dirt and therefore be the source of man's new dynasty. And those that live will ever fear the dragon's tail for many a year. But time erases memory, you think it's strange, but it will be. And before the race is built anew, a silver serpent comes to view, to spew out men of like unknown, to mingle with the earth now grown. Cold from its heat, and these men can enlighten the minds of future man. To intermingle and show them how to live and love and thus endow the children with the second sight. A natural thing so they that might grow graceful, humble and when they do the golden age will start anew. The dragon's tail is but a sign for mankind's fall and man's decline and before this prophecy is done I shall be burned at the stake at one my body singed and my soul set free you 
think I utter blasphemy. You're wrong. These things have come to me. This prophecy will come to be.